This is Barry Zelma speaking for Claim School Incorporated's blog, Zelma on Insurance. Today we're going to speak about how a prison employee committed a crime she was employed to prevent and was found to be guilty of workers' compensation fraud. On January 10, 2022, defendant Tiffany Marvell Jones was convicted by a jury of one count of insurance fraud. Jones filed a motion for a new trial, which was denied, and on appeal, Jones argued that there was insufficient evidence to support the verdict, that her trial counsel provided ineffective assistance, and that the trial court abused its discretion when it denied her motion for a new trial. In the People v. Tiffany Marvell Jones, the California Court of Appeal on March 14, 2024, affirmed her conviction. It all began on January 10, 2022, when Jones was found guilty by a jury. Jones was sentenced on September 30, 2022, and granted probation for a term of two years. One of the conditions of probation was that Jones served the first 180 days of her probationary period in jail. Jones worked for a state prison in May of 1995. She was a return-to-work coordinator for the prisons. If a staff member was injured, they would go through the return-to-work office to file workers' compensation claims so the staff member could be paid while he or she was off work. On February 14, Jones filed a DWC-1 form, an application, to file a workers' compensation claim alleging that on February 11, 2014, a large file shell fell on her, injuring her left thigh and below her knee. As soon as a workers' compensation claim is filed, the state prison informs the insurance company. The insurance company does an investigation and either accepts or denies the claim. If it is accepted, the insurance company lets the state prison know and the state prison will pay the injured worker for the first 52 weeks. This is referred to as industrial disability leave. Injured workers are allowed to get a second job, but they need to report the income to the insurance company. Reporting a second job without reporting the income is not sufficient. The insurance company then reduces the amount it pays the injured worker by the amount the injured worker makes at his or her second job. In February of 2017, Jones began working for a real estate company as a sales associate. Jones's IRS Form 1099 for 2017 from the real estate company indicated that after certain amounts were deducted, Jones earned $25,095. Jones did not report that she was earning secondary income to her claims adjuster at the insurance company, and the adjuster never asked. Jones did fill out a secondary employment form from the state prison listing her secondary employer as a real estate company. It was approved on behalf of the warden on or about April 24, 2017, as required by the state prison's policy. Jones was deposed, however, on October 11, 2017, regarding her workers' compensation claim, and when asked how many ounces she had in escrow, she responded, two. However, based on Jones's 1099 form from the real estate company, prior to the date of the deposition, Jones had already closed seven home sales and earned $20,312. A court, when evaluating a sufficiency of evidence claim, it will review the whole record in the light most favorable to the judgment to determine whether it discloses substantial evidence, that is, evidence that is reasonable, credible, and of solid value from which a reasonable trier of fact could find 
the defendant guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. An intent to defraud, the court noted, is an intent to deceive another person for the purpose of gaining some material advantage over that person or to induce that person to part with property or to alter the person's position to its injury or risk and to accomplish that person by some false statement, false representation of fact, wrongful concealment, or suppression of truth, or by any other artifice or act designed to deceive. There was substantial evidence, the Court of Appeal found, from which a jury could reasonably infer that Jones knew that she was supposed to report her real estate income to the insurance company because that was what she did when she worked in the prison, and that she did not do so, and that she lied about not having real estate income at the deposition. The Court of Appeal also concluded that the trial court did not abuse its discretion in denying Jones's motion for a new trial because in making that determination, the court found that Jones clearly received income, yet intentionally failed to disclose it. Contrary to Jones's assertion, the trial court assert, addressed the expense evidence as to the specific intent element and found that Jones knew that she had to report her income, even if it was exceeded by her expenses, but intentionally, intentionally failed to do so. Therefore, they affirmed her conviction. In my opinion, Mrs. Ms. Jones lied at deposition about her earnings with a secondary employer while on workers' comp compensation, which she knew from her employment with the state prison that she was required to report to the insurer about her secondary employment. Her appeal was incredible, and the court refused to give any credibility to her claims. She will spend a small time in the prison where she used to work or in the county jail, and will go back to making more money than she ever did working for the prison by selling real estate. This video was adapted from my blog, Zelma on Insurance, which is available free to anyone who clicks on the URL zalma.com slash blog. You can subscribe to the blog, and you will receive notice of every blog posting, usually five, sometimes six a week. And you will also have access to the more than 4,750 blog postings. Please tell your friends and colleagues about this blog and the videos and let them subscribe to the blog and the videos along with you. And if you're interested in receiving more detailed information about insurance, insurance claims, insurance law, and insurance fraud, please consider, for a very small fee, subscribing to my Substack publication. Thank you for your attention.